Hi, I'm Josh Brown from Ritholtz Wealth Management. We are live from the compound. I got Michael Batnick here with me as usual and our friend Sir Jamie Catherwood uh, of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management also writes this really great blog called Investor Amnesia. I don't love the name, but I love the blog. It's brutal, but thank you. you. you do, no, you do really good content. And the content that you do is primarily looking at the amnesia that we have in terms of markets and investing. And I think your overarching message is that all of this stuff has happened before. You just have to find some obscure books and, and go to the library and you can see that we are just living in this endless loop of fear and greed. Um, but in particular, we're going to talk about fintech. And the way you phrase it is that fintech and financial advice have uh, an ancient relationship. What do you mean by that? So. William Getzman at Yale, he's a professor of finance history. He has done incredible research. He's like the OG of financial history. And he found a tablet in from 2100 BCE in ancient Mesopotamia. That was the first like financial model, if you want to call it. And in this case, the asset was a herd of cows, but that's what farmers, you know. It's like the Hammurabi hedge fund? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so this tool was written in cuneiform, it was like coding, and it was calculating the growth of the herd over time and the output in their local currency silver of the cheese and milk. Oh and my so God. it was like the dairy yield, but it was forecasting the growth, so like an earnings growth model. And then there's some ridiculous return assumptions, though, because there's like no cow's ever going to die. Okay. And, uh, so, 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 no mortal cows. so chiseling those calculations into a tablet is almost like an early form of Back to fintech. Thing. Yeah, it's like a platform, <clears throat> and someone was using that to give financial advice. Like, These guys I are think, running cattle regressions yeah. <laughs> like way back in the day. I just need to email you my article, and you come up with much better terms than I have. Well, wait, is that <laughs> even before the wheel? I don't even know. Oh, wow. I don't think the so. The wheel but. comes from ancient Sumeria. They yeah. might have, like, they, in other words, they might have had Money Guide Pro before they had the wheel. Is that <laughs> what you're saying? Let's just go ahead and make that but claim. But so, so the the biggest or probably most important in, invention that like flattened uh, the spread of information, sort of like the printing press did, was the ticker. Yeah. So before the ticker came about, technology was basically non-existent. In, I mean, modern technology that we would recognize in the world of finance. So, and so how did people get prices? So before that, before the ticker comes out, board, first. Right? So you had to be either at the exchange physically to know what the price of stocks were, because before that, like the largest brokerage houses in New York, like the Goldman, I mean, like these are the big firms. They were sending their clients stock prices that were 12 days old. So imagine trying to trade like information that's mm. two weeks old. And apart from that, the prices weren't necessarily correct because the Wall Street Journal in 1868 started printing prices just based off what the last broker trading on the exchange told them it was. So if I was, you know, what's the price of this railroad company? And you were the last guy there and you're just like, uh, 50, 33. Wall Street Journal's like, all right, cool. And then That's they it. just printed it the Data. next day. So yeah, so you can imagine <laughs> that there was uh, some nefarious actions by some of these brokers who would benefit if the price was lower or higher. So they just gave wrong. So you wrote... With each added layer of communication between the data source and an investor in the pre-ticker era, the accuracy of information worsened. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you're just going off what some schmuck said the price was, like, how is a financial advisor going to be able to say, all right, this price informs me of the client's portfolio, and now I can go to the client with this information. Like, so you can't so do there was just rampant ripoffs. Yeah. And I mean, I don't think it was even ripoffs. It was just, I mean, like the advisor, they're just seeing, okay, Wall Street Journal prints, this was the price of stocks yesterday but this was just what some guy said the price of a stock was yesterday. So you can't really give good financial advice. Like so, they were doing do think, the best they could. So you thought, think that people that had actual prices were just, there's just arbitrage opportunities all over the place? Yeah, I mean. Of course there was. And that, you know, that's one of the, the debates about high frequency trading, how it's so unfair because so-and-so's server is so much closer to the exchange than someone else's, and this one has faster fiber optic. There have always been advantages born out of either confusion or a distance from the information. Like that arms race has been going on. So, I mean, you know the story about um, how the Rothschilds knew that Napoleon won mm. because they had a network of people with boats and running and maybe pigeons. Yep. And uh, they were diabolical. They, they, so they knew, uh, they knew Napoleon lost yep. at Waterloo. Mm -hmm. And so they started shorting. There weren't stocks then. There were consoles, which are British bonds. They started shorting consoles. Everyone saw them doing it and said, they must know something that Wellington lost, Napoleon won. 
the whole market got massively short, and then they went the other way, like at the end of trading places. Yeah. Um, and they made a, a windfall, but that was an information advantage. And since we've been doing that for hundreds of years, it's almost naive to say I won't invest yeah. because somebody has faster information than me. That will always well, that be was the like, case. That was like the premise of um, of Flash Boys that the market is rigged, and so right, Rig- rigged since from conception. Right. Yeah. The New York Stock Exchange was literally people rigging their advantages in a formal document. So, so the ticker was like the original Bloomberg. You, know, yeah. you so, said that there was 23,000 offices paid for ticket services in the United States? Yeah, I think that was by like 1905. And so, exactly. So, to your point, though, there was literally high frequency traders, like people. They called them pad shovers in these days where pad a guy... Pad shovers? Yeah. Was that, like, was that like a pejorative term? No, I think that's literally what they were called oh, okay. because <laughs> there would be like three people involved. There would be one guy in the exchange, windows open, yells out the price to no. a guy in the street, writes it down on the pad, sprints like across the street to the brokerage office. He's like, 32, 47. And then they do something with so that information. Did they pay like based on how fast you were? Like the runners, like Usain Bolt would have gotten a huge premium? I don't know. That's going to require some further research. <laughs> but, great, uh, they're great like old time photographs of the bucket shops. Oh yeah. And bucket shop has a pejorative term now, but a um, hundred years ago it was the only place that a civilian could trade because mm. you didn't have a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. And it was like a kid on a ladder next to a chalkboard, yeah, and then everyone sitting in the audience relying on this kid to put up the price, and that I th- maybe predates the ticker. Isn't that why Livermore didn't make it? Like he was doing well in the bucket shops, and then he went to the stock exchange to actually trade, but the quotes like weren't he weren't. Lost his, he lost his advantage. Yeah, but so to your point for democratizing information. So before that, the pad shovers, like if you're some guy in I don't know. Virginia or DC, you're not at the exchange. So you're just getting those two week old letters in the mail saying this is what the prices were. But with the ticker and the cables that connected advisor firms around the country and brokerage offices to the exchange, then suddenly you could get real time information. And so access to good financial advice wasn't just limited in New York. So like today, St. Louis had a big brokerage community yeah. because of that. And <laughs> so there is, yeah, and, there's a guy in Florida, like in Palm Beach, who paid for a cable to be run all the way down, and then his brokerage office could give people financial advice. Was that Doug Cass? I don't know. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I wanted to ask you. Part of what you're saying here is that financial advice, the business of financial advice, is eternal. Like it has always been a thing, and it always will. And the tools change to deliver it mm. and to do it well. Yeah. But the idea of people having excess capital and wanting help with what they're supposed to do with it, that's like as old as time. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you explain a little bit what you mean by that? Yeah. So the main point of this article was that instead of today, I mean, because today there's so much new technology in every industry, but in the financial advice industry, you know, someone, someone could easily argue that, you know, incorrectly, but robo advisor is just going to replace all financial, like no one will ever need a financial advisor again. But the point of this article was, Technology just helps advisors do their job more efficiently and more accurately because now you have access to information that can help you make better decisions and help your clients. And so the point of this is that this has been happening for thousands of years. And what are the odds that now in this period, like this is going to be the time where it actually wipes out the industry of financial advisors? It's not. It's always going to be there. There's always going to be that combination. And yeah, so that was like I did. I did a thing about your your example might predate mine. I did a thing about how the first recorded financial advisor um, was Joseph. I, like literally, he's in the Pharaoh's prisons. Yeah, Fami? Uh, Joe Fami. Um, no, but this does take place in Egypt. But he's in the he's in the Pharaoh's prison, and the Pharaoh asks him to interpret his dreams. And yeah. it's uh, it turn, it's seven lean years, seven fat years followed by seven lean years. Um, so first of all, that's an economic forecast. And then second, uh, the Pharaoh sets him free and rewards him. Yeah. If you will run the granaries for me and, and help me man- literally manage the finances of Egypt, um, I will give you a percentage of all of the, and I mean, it's asset-based pricing, yeah. essentially. That's, I'll give you, I think it was a third or it was a big number. Yeah. Uh, and that's what enabled him to bring, it was a big mistake, bring his whole <laughs> family and tribe of, of Jews into Egypt. Bad, bad trade. But um, you have some other examples of ancient tablets and, and things that have been found where people were trying to understand markets or people were trying to plan their finances. What are some of the examples that you found? So the first one was that cow model. Okay. And then, but... To your point about the asset-based pricing, there's an interesting example with the ticker where with all the new technology, 
the individual investor then didn't think, okay, I don't need an advisor or broker anymore. I'll just do it myself. They actually felt more overwhelmed by all this information and they wanted someone to help guide them. And so there is an interesting quote in there from a magazine. I think actually literally was the ticker magazine in like 1902, where someone wrote in like an op-ed saying, take the medical profession. When you're ill and go to a doctor, after the usual questions and examination of pulse tongue, he informs, it informs his diagnosis. He searches his brain for a remedy best suited to your ailment and prescribes it to you. And surgery experts are at hand who may be called in for consultation, who take no part in the performance of an operation. Now I want to know this. Why cannot this why cannot this high authority plan be applied to the investment business? There ought to be some there ought to be someone of wide experience and established reputation, an expert noted for his care, accuracy, and conservatism in such matters, to whom the investor can go and lay down five, ten, twenty five dollars in exchange for money making or money saving advice. Wow. When was that? Nineteen oh eight. Ticker magazine. So that ended up happening. Yeah. Uh like big league. Was yeah. Ticker <laughs> magazine bought by Axios? <laughs> so so Business Insider. So FinTech FinTech today obviously doesn't resemble what FinTech was, but nor should it. Yeah. But to your point, like when TurboTax came along, the prevailing wisdom was this is the end of accountants. Mm. There are more accountants than ever right now. 20 years after the advent of TurboTax, maybe 25 years uh, after. Um, and who is the biggest consumer of TurboTax? It's CPAs. It's accountants adapted that technology into their practice, and that meant they could maybe do the taxes for 12 people in a day rather than three mm -hmm. because some of the calculations got faster and more efficient. So I think that's a good, I hate this phrase, it's a good mental model <laughs> to think about how technology will become incorporated in the business of financial advice. Where do you think we are today? Do you think that we're ex experiencing something of a renaissance in financial technology or like, what are your thoughts? I mean, I think definitely, I think, so this isn't to say, you know, that technology isn't useful. It's to say that it's just going to make advisors perform their practice better. And I think today we're seeing a similar period where like the ticker, I mean, it changed the game like completely. And I think today you're having technology come out that is going to change the game. And there's just steps that keep happening. Like ETFs were helpful. I mean, that changed the game. Is there something at Wealthstack that we're going to be talking about? You guys are going to be talking about? Yeah, I think there's going to be an interesting uh, unveiling. Just to back up, uh, Wealthstack, um, is I think the first event to blend wealth management with technology um, and the, the idea is about what will the future of financial advice look like. So you guys at O'Shaughnessy Asset Management obviously have a big role to play uh, as people who do asset management and work with financial advisors like us. Like you guys are unveiling, I know you guys are unveiling something, we're not gonna talk about it now, but like um, I would imagine a lot of the focus on what O'Shaughnessy's doing day to day is more and more about tech. Yeah. And that makes perfect sense. Okay. Um, do you have any parting words? Uh, thank you for having me on. Are I you going to rethink uh, the name of the blog from Investor Amnesia? Can we can we come up with a different name? I'm pretty bummed that you don't like it. You're like the first person to give me negative feedback on this. Well, you never and asked I just think me about it's, it. It's literally the perfect, I mean, Amnesia, forget, you know, like right. this time isn't different. So you got the, you know, forgetting. Mm. part addressed right, and I'm gonna investing all right how about this it's light on the little alliteration how about this go check out jamie's <laughs> blog it's awesome how, how often are you posting once a week yeah once you're, a week or more you're crushing it and everything he does um gives you great background on the history of these things and then brings you up to today and it's really a clever hook and i love it go read jamie's blog read a few of his articles and then come back to the comments below and tell us what he should change the name <laughs> of his blog to and i don't know if he's going to listen um but let's do that let us know what you think make sure you're following jamie on twitter what's your uh, what's your handle there we go. JFC underscore three underscore. What? What's wrong with you? Yeah. You want to talk about bad names? Holy we should focus cow. on that. You have underscores in your Twitter handle? Twice. Whoa. It's more impressive. How do you like fight all the girls off? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, and also come up with names for Jamie's Twitter handle. Thank you so much for uh, being live from the compound. We Thank love you for stuff. having me. All right. Talk to you soon.